H, appreciate. Reward a job well done. Appreciate. Why should the leader show appreciation? Well, you're probably not that different from anyone else. Don't you try harder if you think you're appreciated? <laughs> if you appreciate appreciation, don't you think other people appreciate appreciation? That if you've delegated something to someone and uh, they've done that ministry, then follow up with some form of appreciation. The author of Hebrews said it this way. I, I really enjoy going to Hebrews 6 and reading it whenever I'm maybe a little bit discouraged. It says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. He's showing appreciation to these people. He's saying, you did a good job. You're helping his people. You're actually serving God as you help his people. Thank you. Keep it up. How do you do that? How do you show appreciation? Two simple things to keep in mind. Thank them directly. Without flattery. You're not lying. You're not flattering people. But thank them as sincerely as you can directly. Speak well to them. Paul's personal interaction with Philemon is a good model. Philemon's only one chapter long, but in verses 4 through 7 it says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Okay, so you're Philemon and you get that letter. And Paul says, you know what, Philemon? I appreciate you so much. Your faith is making a difference. Your life is making a difference in God's people. Do you think Philemon got that and felt more likely to do ministry or less likely to do ministry? You know, he got that letter. He says, hey, boy, Paul noticed. That's wonderful. You know, I think I'll get more involved here. I think I'll get more involved in ministry. Speak well to people directly. Speak well about people or of people. Honor them indirectly. You know, sometimes we forget uh, the historical contexts of certain Bible verses, but I think of Romans 16. Uh, Romans 16, Paul's wrapping up his letter to the Romans, and he makes his personal comment. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant, or maybe even literally a deacon, of the church at Cancrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. Okay, so Paul's speaking of this lady, Phoebe, who's been such a, just such a help in the church. He says, she's been a help to me. She's been a help to the church. Where was Phoebe when this letter was written out loud? She's probably right there in the congregation. You think about it. Phoebe was from Cancrea. That was near Corinth. But for some reason, she was in Rome. She might have actually helped bring this letter. She might have been in the entourage who carried this letter to Rome. So here's Phoebe. She's visiting Rome. She's happening to be a visitor. She's a visitor in the church. And one of the elders stands up and reads this letter from Paul. And he gets to chapter 16 and he says, Hey, this lady, Phoebe, she's such a help to me. She's such a help to the church. And she's sitting right there in the congregation. How do you think she's feeling at that point? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's nice to be appreciated. You know, she hears Paul indirectly commending her to a whole church. That would have to be so encouraging to her. I believe that leaders need to cultivate a whole context, a whole demeanor of appreciation. That the people that you work with, the people you lead over time, should understand that they're appreciated. That normally speaking, you're communicating directly, indirectly, I appreciate you so much, thank you so much for this or that. How do you do that? How do you show appreciation? Some of you could help me with this. Here's some ideas. Regularly write notes of thanks. Respond immediately to praiseworthy accomplishments. Catch people doing something right. A leader is watching. You're watching. And you see people doing things. Um, you thank them. You thank them for their ministry. It might even be something behind the scenes. I remember one time seeing one of the boys in our church standing and holding a door open for one of the senior citizens. Now, I could just in my head say, that was kind of nice. But to go up to him and call him by name and say, I noticed you how you held the door for Mrs. So-and-so. That was really good of you. Thank you for doing that. That shows that you have a sensitive heart and you respect your elders. That's wonderful. You know what he's going to do the next time he sees an old person coming toward the door? <laughs> 
He's going to race over to be the first one to hold it open. You know, you catch people doing something right. You thank them for it. You know what? Email might be a curse in some ways, but it's a real blessing in others. It's amazing how many emails you can write per day. You're taking notes. You're keeping reminders to yourself in your PDA or note card or your, your clipboard or something. You're writing down to thank so and so and so and so and so and so and so. And you sit down at your computer the next day and you start going through your list and you say, you know, I want to thank so and so. You know, a lot of the emails I send are only two or three sentences long. Thanks so much for your ministry this way or thanks so much for doing that. I want you to know I really appreciate you. Send. Send. And, and you, you make that a life habit. Some of you write personal notes. I got a nice handwritten personal note the other day in the mail from someone in the church. Handwritten. Remember those handwritten notes? <laughs> I'll keep it. I'll file it away. And I, I have what I call my Blue Monday file. <laughs> and uh, I haven't had to pull it out for a while, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> but on the hard days, you know, you can pull those out and you say, oh, yeah. That's wonderful. So-and-so was impacted for the glory of God. Yeah, that person was really encouraged. That's great, you know, and you pull those out. They're wonderful. You be the one to write some of those notes so that you can encourage someone. And if you're a leader, just make, make it a habit of life. Make it part of who you are as a leader, that part of who you are as a leader is showing appreciation. And you start in the home. For us married men, how often do we thank our wives? Do we say, honey, thank you so much? I mean, even little things. I mean, I try to help around the house, but there are some household tasks I hardly ever do. My wife does the laundry almost 100% of the time. You know, I can say, did you put away my socks? <laughs> or I could say, Gladine, thank you so much for doing the laundry. I appreciate that. You know, it saves me time and very thoughtful of you to do that without me even asking. Thank you. You know, that we show appreciation. We see our kids doing things around the house. Thank you so much. I saw how you picked up that stuff without me asking that. That was nice. Thank you so much for doing that. You know, and you develop. And you know what? The, if you do that as a life, the people around you will start doing it. The people around you will start doing it to the people that they're impacting. And they'll begin to develop that culture of showing appreciation. And, and you're going to be a little family or a group or a department at work or whatever that's, that's pleasant to be around because the people are just appreciative. They tend to thank other people. That's part of ministry and of a leader. And then I replicate, replicate. What's replicate mean? It means multiplying yourself, multiplying yourself by developing new servant leaders, having a vision that goes beyond your own lifetime, underline, star, whatever you need to do. Make this one of your highest priorities. You want your ministry to survive you. So you're going to be training a next generation and the generation after that. Who should be chosen? 2 Timothy 2.2 2 comes to my mind. You look for people of conviction, people that share your conviction that leadership is all about service. So you're, you're, you're looking at the next spiritual generation, maybe even the next physical generation. You're saying, who should I be pouring my life into? Who should I be, who should I be cultivating? Who can I be replicating? And you look for people who share your conviction that leadership is all about service. Um, look for character. Just as people look for character in your life before you became a leader, now you're passing that on and you're looking for character in the lives of the people that you are developing, cultivating, replicating for leadership. Uh, remember those character traits found in the pastoral epistles. And then obviously look for competency. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So you want people to have the gifts necessary to carry out the ministry that you're asking them to do. So just as we look for conviction character and competency in you now as you tend to replicate your own self your own ministry you're looking for the same things in the next generation you're looking for that conviction that leadership is all about service you're looking for character of life and you're looking for competency how do you reproduce new leaders how do you do that folks i know this is the end of the day but stick with me because this is where the rubber hits the road how do you reproduce another generation of leaders i learned this from the missionary David Sitton. It's not complicated. Step number one, I'll do it, you watch. Leaders must model the leadership they desire. People emulate what they see modeled. 
Great leadership always cultivates the next generation of people and ideas. Mentoring is one of the best ways to foster that cultivation process. In other words, have people with you. Share your ministry. Have people watch you do ministry. Ask their involvement. Ask their critique. That they're involved in your life. They're with you. And that's one way you're going to reproduce yourself is by spending time with people, having them watch you do ministry, even getting involved with it. Secondly, you do it, I'll watch. And now you're stepping aside, as it were. You're stepping aside and you're inviting someone else to do what you used to do. You're sharing your ministry with future leaders. This is what Cheryl was saying earlier, John Maxwell. It's quicker and easier to do the work yourself in the short run. In the longer, harder road of equipping others pays in the long run. If you will invest that time up front, and yes, it takes more time. But if you invest that time up front, it'll pay off in the long run. Because now those people that you have trained will be able to take over that job, take over that ministry, get it off of your plate, and they're running with it, and you don't even have to be that involved. I can still remember when I was dating my wife. My wife is the oldest of three. Bob's wife is the middlest. And then we have a brother-in-law who's a little bit younger. And I can remember dating my wife, and my now brother-in-law was early teens, 13, 14 at the time. And I remember going to see my girlfriend at her parents' house, and uh, my girlfriend's dad was teaching his son how to fix a motorbike, one of these little motor scooters. And, uh, and they were out there for a long time doing something. I forget what they were doing, putting a new chain on it or something. And my father-in-law caught me later and said, you know what, Larry? I could have fixed that motorbike a lot faster myself. But then Chucky wouldn't know how to do it. And see, my, our brother-in-law today is actually pretty good at stuff like that because his dad took the time, invested the time to teach him. And that's true in all of life. Yeah, it takes more time up front but it's better in the long run. You're actually investing in the long run. So don't be afraid to share the ministry. I'll do it, you watch me, but then we're going to shift. You're going to do it, and I'm going to watch you. There's a third step, though, and that is this. You do it and have someone else watch. And now the baton's been passed. I mentioned David Sitton earlier, and this is how he taught me this lesson. David was used of the Lord to start 10 churches in Papua New Guinea before he saw his 35th birthday. Blows my mind. And all of those churches, I asked him not long ago how those 10 churches are doing. They're all doing well. Now those churches are sending out missionaries to other tribes. And I said, how did you do it? And he shared with me this very simple process. And he showed me some pictures of a baptism in one of those churches. Here's David down in the river. There have been, I don't know, let's say 15 converts in that village. And he knows that this guy and that guy, they show real promise to be leaders. I think I'll give those guys extra time. And so here are these 15 new believers in the village. David gets down in the river, and he points to one of these guys that he has his eye on for leadership. He comes down in the river, and he baptizes this guy. The guy stands up and starts to get out of the river. And David says, where are you going? And so I'm, I'm done, you know, it's time for the next one. He says, oh, no, you're staying here. And he says, you're baptizing the next one. And the guy says, whoa, you know, I've never baptized anyone. I can't do that. And he says, I'll show you how. Takes the second guy, brings the second guy down the river, and he says, now, to the first guy, he says, now, you help me. You help me. Just like, just like I did it to you, we're going to do it to this guy. You help me. And so here's this photo of David and this uh, future church leader from that village in Papua New Guinea baptizing the second convert. And then guess who gets out of the river? David did. And now here are these two guys still wet from their own baptisms, <laughs> baptizing the third. I thought, what a simple model. What a simple model. But the Lord used him in that simple model to plant church after church that are now planting other churches in Papua New Guinea. I'll do it, you watch. You do it, I'll watch. You do it and have someone else watch or be involved. It's a wonderful model that way. You're training a whole other generation of leaders that way. You know, um, our kids are all grown and married. The last got married just less than a year ago. And it is encouraging. It is encouraging for people to come up to Gladine and I and say, boy, you guys did such a wonderful job raising your kids. 
And I appreciate the encouragement, but you know what I sometimes say if I'm pretty close to the person? Thanks for the encouragement, but I'm still waiting. You know what I'm waiting for? I want to see how my kids raise their kids. If you want to compliment Gladine and I on how we raised our kids, the jury's still out. Why don't you wait for another 15 or 20 years and see how they do it raising their kids? Um, I, I want to see that. I want to see that third generation. You know, I, I want to see how they are being trained in the ways of the Lord. Then I'll know. Then I'll know. Thank you for, for using me in the lives of my kids because now my kids are discipling their kids for the glory of God. And you have to be patient because that takes a while. Um, but it's that kind of vision. And I see if you're going to replicate yourself, you're going to have that long-range vision. You're going to be very future-looking. You're going to be very long-range. You're thinking, I want to train the next generation in such a way that they train the next generation in such a way that they train the next generation. The real test of leadership is what happens when the baton is passed. True success requires successors. Pass the baton. Multiply yourself. Um, don't let your ministry die with you. I was speaking this week, Monday. I was in Michigan speaking at a pastor's fellowship. And I knew who these men would be before I got there. I've spoken to this group before, except for uh, Rod Valentine, who was with me. I was probably, no, there was only Rod and one other man who were younger than I in this pastor's fellowship. There are pastors in that group that are in their 80s and still at it. Now we can celebrate that and say, praise God, that these men are still at it at their advanced age. But well, my concern was, who's going to take the baton? We all are passing off the scene. We all are passing off the scene. Some of you will probably pass off the scene soon. Not to be morbid, but if you're in your 80s, you probably don't have too many more years. Who have you passed the baton to? Who have you prepared? Some of you don't have much time left. You better get about the business of passing the baton to live life in such a way no matter what it is, in your workplace, in your family, in your school, in the church, that you're, you're so much oriented to training the next generation that when you move away or when you die, you're not going to be missed. That's the goal. The goal is to not be missed. I mean, people might miss your friendship, but the ministry or the work that you've developed doesn't come to a screeching halt because the Lord called you home that the ministry you've been involved in just, just goes on. It just goes on. And you say, well, how can it just go on? Well, because you've replicated yourself. You've passed the baton. Keep that in mind all the time. And raising your family, your small group leader, your pastor, your foreman at work, whatever it is, you're always training the next generation. That's just part of who you are, that you're replicating yourself. In conclusion, commit yourself to be a lifelong learner in the realm of leadership. Pray this prayer that Hybels gives us here. God, I want to be a better leader than I am. I don't want to stand before you someday and have to admit that I've squandered the opportunities you have given me, a missing word, have given me. I want to develop my leadership skills to the peak of my potential. I need your help. Please direct my growth and instruct me in the way I should go. Wouldn't that be a good prayer request? Lord, I want to grow. I want to be a better leader tomorrow than I am today. I would encourage you to make a lifelong habit of reading books on leadership or articles on leadership. And I do give you a bibliography at the end on pages 35 and 36. I encourage you again to find a mentor. He who walks with the wise will be wise. And just get going. Be a better leader in the context you are. And I say this particularly to those of you that are younger. It's tempting when you're younger to say, well, someday I'll be a leader. You're a leader now. You're a leader now. You're a leader on your campus, you're a leader with your friends, you're a leader with younger siblings. No matter what age you are, there are people, there are somebody that's looking up to you. There are people that are looking up to you. Start now. Be the best leader you can be now and continue to grow. Some of you said earlier that being a leader is hard, and it is. And yet, if that is God's calling on your life, and I believe that it is for all of us or nearly all of us here in this room, then we have our eyes on that one and that day. And everything will be worth it when we hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I love the way A.T. Robertson said it. The minister or the servant leader will one day meet Christ who will inspect his work, praise a sweet 
But the praise from Christ will be the sweetest of all if he says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Amen? Amen.